Since the planting of the cross at Cape Henry in 1607, when English settlers dedicated this new world to God and the gospel, American history has recorded an uncanny pattern. At moments of crisis, when it seems disaster is imminent, something else happens time and time again, deliverance from crisis and progress toward a better future. Author Michael Medved says America's blessings are not due to random chance, but a reflection of God's guidance and intervention. In his new book, The American Miracle, Divine Providence in the Rise of the Republic, the best-selling author and radio host tells about some of the most significant events in America's rise to prosperity and power. And he reveals that what's at the heart of it all is what the founders always believed, that events of our nation's history unfolded not by accident, but according to a providential master plan. Well, the book is called The American Miracle, Divine Providence and the Rise of the Republic. And Michael, you're with us to talk more about this. Um, I've read a lot of George Washington and the number of times he refers to providence uh, is amazing. I think most Americans don't realize that. But what, what was it about him that, that caused that? He, he seemed to be a miracle man. He, he was. Uh, my, my chapter about Washington in the book is called Indispensable, Indestructible. And, and people around him uh, came to believe that he was indestructible. I mean, I, I tell the story of when he was first uh, a 23-year-old colonel, mm -hmm. lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia. And he was part of the officer corps that rode out into the Battle of Monongahela in 1755. And again, 23 years old, there were 70 British officers on horseback. 69 of them were either killed or wounded. Wow. Washington was not. And he had two mounts shot out from under him. He had a bullet knock his hat off his head. He had bullet holes in his clothes. And it was so remarkable that 23-year-old guy, Samuel Davies, who later became president of Princeton, he was one of the most important preachers of the time, uh, Presbyterian, mm -hmm. he, he actually delivered a sermon and said, I cannot but hope that Providence has preserved this heroic youth, Colonel Washington, for some signal purpose to his country. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good, uh, uh, again, pretty good endorsement. <laughs> 21 years before 1776. Um, I've heard that the Indians actually claimed that they, they wanted to meet him because they had targeted him well, because I, he was on a horseback. This is, is that the, apocryphal? It, it, it is not apocryphal. I, I spent a great deal of time on that in the book because um, this is the story of what's called the Indian prophecy. And Washington's almost descendant, his step-grandson, uh, had spoken to Dr. Craig, who had accompanied Washington on a well-documented expedition to the wilderness. And on that expedition, and there are a bunch of people around the campfire, and this was verified by at least two of them, there was an elderly Indian who came forward, and this was years after that battle of Monongahela, and they said, Washington is going to become a great chief. He wasn't yet, you know, it was before the revolution. Mm -hmm. And they said, on the battle, we, our bullets couldn't miss. We killed all the British. This was a disaster for the British army. He said, but bullets were powerless against this young man and we were certain that the great spirit protected him. Now, this was written about and became very popular after Washington's death, which is again, one of these strange coincidences. He died on December 14th, 1799, just weeks before the end of a whole century that he had dominated with his personality. And, and, and again, cheating death again and again. There's another story before the Battle of Brandywine. Uh, the most famous marksman in the history of the British Army was Major Patrick Ferguson. And right before the battle, he's with a nest of snipers and Washington rides into sight. And he's wearing a large co cocked hat and a cloak and he said, after the battle, Ferguson, he said, um, I could have put six musket balls into him without question, but it wasn't pleasant to me to harm someone who was so coolly attending to his duty. It's uh, wow. just remarkable. <laughs> Something, in other words, came over him. And, and there's stories and stories and stories like this. Andrew Jackson who uh, is a, a dominant figure in our early history, 
1835, he goes to the Capitol building. It's his second term as president. He's an old man. He's at the end of his second term. He goes for a funeral of an ally of his who's a congressman from South Carolina. He's walking out of the funeral. He's under the rotunda. And all of a sudden, the crowd hears a gunshot. A, an unemployed house painter, British national, had come up to Jackson and fired at him with a musket from six feet away. You can't miss from six feet away. Yeah. It misfired. The, the, and then Jackson starts beating him with his cane. <laughs> The guy takes out a second gun, Oh, fires again. It misfires. They later tested these muskets. There was nothing wrong with them. They just had misfired. And, and again, at the time, they rated the chances of that happening as one in 250,000. It's probably mathematically worse than that. All right, well, let's talk about the election of Abraham Lincoln, because I think without him in the presidency, the nation would have divided. No, there's no question about it. I, I mean, I, I, I cite uh, in the book some, some of the conclusive historical uh, determinations that Lincoln was the crucial element in Northern victory. And the fact that he became president is preposterous. People think that our current president-elect is an unlikely president. Mm -hmm. He's a billionaire and a famous man. Lincoln was a prairie lawyer. He had served one term in the House of Representatives. When right before the convention, the Republican convention convened in 1860, his hometown paper, the Chicago Tribune, ranked the possible Republicans in the order of likelihood. Lincoln ranked 14th, and they thought he was all wrong. And yet he wins the nomination on the third ballot, partially because Judge Davis helps to give out maybe counterfeit tickets to stock the galleries with Lincoln supporters. And then again, he becomes this American miracle because Lincoln had a total of six months that he had spent in any school of any form. And he is one of the great prose writers and one of the great the theological thinkers of all of history. Have we gotten away from the concept that providence is guiding America, that we are a city on the hill? We, we have, and the consequences have been dire. Because look, America's emergence as the dominant power in the world, militarily, culturally, economically, is totally unlikely. So people basically come to one of two ways to explain it. Either you explain it based upon America got to be so powerful because we're bad, because mm -hmm. we enslave people, because we destroy Native Americans. And by the way, you can argue against that argument because other countries that did it even worse than we did never gained the kind of success America did. We gained that success in spite of our sometimes cruel behavior, not because of it. So then you're left with the question, how do you explain America? And ultimately, it can't be just random accidents. It's not random evolution. It's intelligent design. So who's the designer? There are a lot of people who will say, okay, America have very good design, but it's these smart founders. It's Franklin and Adams and Washington and Hamilton and Madison. Okay, except they all saw themselves as the instruments of design, mm -hmm. not its authors. Right. They all did, including they the ones who- They all credited Providence with the ideas that they came up with. No, entirely, and with all of these coincidences that kept helping them. For instance, the amazing story of the Battle of Brooklyn. And this is one of these stories when, when I was writing about it, uh, it makes the hairs on your forearms sort of stand up because, wow. Um, George Washington loses the biggest battle of the Revolutionary War in terms of the number of men mm -hmm. involved. There is a, a British army of 30,000, crushes the Americans, and then surrounds them and traps them. They're trapped in Brooklyn Heights after losing the battle. British army surrounding them, on the East River, British men of war and the British Navy, how do they get out? They're talking about surrender or maybe fighting to the death against overwhelming odds. It's August of 1776. August in New York. August in New York is pretty sticky. Yeah. All of a sudden, the fog comes up out of nowhere. And everyone, again, at the time, saw this as a miracle, as an act of God. It was. The fa it, well, it clearly was. <laughs> because they all said so. Because yeah. it comes up out of nowhere, covers the river. They row across in, in, in silence and success. Don't lose a single boat. 
And Washington is on the last boat. And the moment that he sets foot safely on Manhattan Island to take resume command of his troops, the fog miraculously clears. And the British talked about this. They saw what happened to the Americans. They saw it as a wonder, as, as if this was, uh, they referred to it as if Aladdin's magical lamp had somehow made the Americans disappear. Well, it was a bigger magic than, and bigger power than Aladdin. All right. Well, the book is called The American Miracle, uh, Divine Providence and the Rise of the Republic. You can find it wherever books are sold. And I encourage you to get in touch with our history, particularly these miraculous moments where God intervened. And we just have to wonder today, what great plan does God have for America today? And can we dream again that providence is driving us, designing us, compelling us to do his will in the world today.